<laughs> that kind of leads me to the next question. Um, and Bob always carries a pair of shoes just in case we're <laughs> um, It's to do with your backgrounds actually, and they couldn't really be more radically different. You come from, um, you know, your mother and father, actors, sisters, actors. Patrick, you come from a non-acting family. But what I noticed, but I know your sisters and I knew your father, that but one thing that the Cusacks do share, of course, is a fierce loyalty. My God, are they fiercely independent of each other. Yeah. Um, they are seriously independent of each other. As that story proves, you will be indomitable in putting your point of view. Patrick, you too, um, I think, had to probably assert a fair bit of independent will to get into the profession, to get where you are, to come here at not a good time for an English person in Ireland. It called, an enor called for enormous effort of will. And I think one of the qualities, again, that I associate with your separate work is that I can see in it that it's the product of an astonishingly powerful interior examination of what you're at. And that gives to your work this um, very profound understanding of grief, especially. Um, I think it was so, so terrifyingly there in your lady, um, the, the Scotswoman. It was there in Our Lady of Sligo. It was there in um, Sons of Ulster, I'll say it myself. But it's also there in A Woman of No Importance. You get to the terrible heartbreak of that play. That's a hell of a rough burden to put on yourself. Do you find it invigorating? Do you find it threatening? Do you find it too exposing at times? Do you have methods of dealing with it? Because I don't find, I think that while you very brilliantly pull off what you do, you very brilliantly work what you're at, I have to say that I think it must at some level um, scare the bejesus out of you as well. Well, I, I, I used to call, I, I know it sounds a bit grandiose, but I used to call acting the indecent exposure of the soul. Because uh, you, do have to, yeah, you do have to use um, aspects of your own experience. I know it sounds a contradiction, but you have to bring them to bear on the characters you're playing. And as a director, I'd say Patrick is the same. That you bring a sensibility, and if that sensibility has been honed by grief, or loss, or, or uh, luck, or whatever it is that you're born with, the hand of cards you're dealt, um, uh, that, I've lost my train of thought now, yeah, the end is the of the soul, that, that you, you bring that experience bear on whatever character you're playing, that sensibility can, can, will equally work on uh, a Lady Macbeth, or um, a Masha, or a uh, Mayo horror, um, but it is, I suppose, informed by my um, my own experience, and then the symbiosis occurs of uh, Sinead, uh, Mayo horror, and then this person arrives on the stage that is a mixture of all that. And yeah, there are certain parts that have left me absolutely wrecked, and as I said, there are certain parts that I will grieve for forever. You know, I'll miss Juno forever. It makes me sort of a bit weak even to think that I'll never play her again. Um, and there are parts... Yeah, but Frank wrote a play called The Hen House, which was about a woman um, from the north, wasn't she? Mm. Who, who, who had an illegitimate child. She'd had four children, brought them up absolutely in an exemplary fashion. And then her husband died, and then she must have had a little, uh, oh, I don't know, one night stand or whatever, and she got pregnant. And the uh, shame of that illegitimate, illegitimate pregnancy, she put the child in a hen house, and the child lived in the hen house without seeing the light of day for seven years. Terrible blots, blot in the cycle of Ireland, that case, because they put her down. They put her into prison for that. And Frank wrote this amazing play called Hen House, which Danny Boyle directed. And she wrecked me playing that part. I mean, to have to go into where she lived, that woman lived, the pain of what she had to experience, not to mention the child. Yeah, it does leave you a bit. But all these things, I suppose, build towards the person you become, and now 
age 65, I've got a load of experiences, which is, you know, rich, I suppose. And, and as Peter Brook uh, once put forward this idea, she's Bob. Bye, Bob. Don't think we don't notice. <laughs> Uh, Peter was, was at a round table discussion and someone was launching this idea that basically for men anyway, uh, they were deeply influenced by what their father did and if you knew what your father did, you would know who you were and why you were doing it, uh, what you were doing. And they went round the table and came to Peter Brook and said, oh, Peter Brook, you know, this great theatre director and your father, and he said, well, my father made laxatives. <laughs> and it's true, Brooks powders were very successful purgative. Uh, but in a strange way, you see, there's a curious truth in that, because Brook is indeed, you know, one of the greatest theatre directors, uh, and he indeed did purge the theatre in, in many significant ways. It's never been the same since. And my father was a doctor, and my family were, were all men brothers were doctors, and my sister was a nurse, and my mother had been a nurse, but my mother had wanted to be an actress. Uh, so uh, I, I take from my two parents, uh, I do have somewhere in me a, a sense that there is a healing action of the imagination, and that the theatre, if you do it properly, that there is actually a potential, a therapeutic, curative, curative potential in uh, the act of theatre, as well as in making music in, in, in all the aspects, particularly, I think, in theatre. Uh, on my mother's side, she, uh, at 17, she auditioned actually for the Central School in 1939, uh, and uh, indeed uh, auditioned for the great Elsie Fogarty. Oh, the yeah. legendary founder, and was accepted for a place which she was too young to go that year, and that she was accepted for the following year. But then a thing called the Second World War happened in between, and her father, who was a doctor, insisted that she uh, became a nurse, went into medicine, in fact, she became a radiographer during the war. So, in my upbringing, um, and she was also her family were from Galway, so in my upbringing, I suppose I had all these things going on, uh, an awareness of the theatre, and I think why I went to Central, I mean there was no other theatre school I could go to after that, you know, I had to go to Central. Um, and I really didn't know, uh, I tried, I, I auditioned for the acting course and failed, and uh, they called me aside after and said, well, you know, we actually do have um, a course in teaching drama, and we think it would be you know, very suitable. So I said, fine. It's grand. <laughs> That's grand. And I, you know, when I think how innocent, uh, but then you know, we usually are at that age. Uh, and that sort of started the whole thing. So a lot of what you say, I mean, it's very flattering to be, you know, Frank to be told about courage and all that. A, a lot of it was naivety. A lot of it is instinct. Uh, and yes, in yes, in, in you know, in in my more mature years, yes, I mean. Uh, I, I do, I'm aware of all these things. But I think the other formative thing for me uh, was being gay. And that, you know, it's one of those things uh, that can destroy you in certain circumstances, and unfortunately still does for, for, for some people. Or it's the making of you. Uh, and I was very blessed in that both my, my father and mother were extremely supportive. And I suppose in one way, a career in the theatre was like a kind of safe haven. This would be in the late 60s, early 70s, it was like a safe haven. It was, kind of, it was okay to be gay in the theatre, that was all right. Um, and then, you know, I've, I've been very blessed uh, in, in my, my personal life, deeply blessed. Uh, but I think it's, you know, those things happen to you in life and you, they make you question a lot of things. They make you question a lot of things. They make you aware that life isn't exactly as you were told it was. That there are complexities and complications. 
and loss and grief, but there's love and acceptance and compassion. Uh, all these things, all these things uh, are there. And I think, you know, you talk about a sort of sensibility. You, it's, it is essential, I think, how we approach our work is, is who we are. I was going to say, yeah. It, it, it is who we are. Uh, that's often why you know criticism stings so much because it's us, it's us in one sense. I'm, I'm at one remove, thank God. Uh, thank God I failed that audition because I'm really not a very good actor. Uh, but at the same time, I, I, my admiration, my love for actors is is heartfelt. I mean, I think actors are so because in the end, the act of theatre is about you and the performer. Uh, the designers, the directors, the playwrights too, in one sense, step back. The energy of the moment and it's that, that brutal curative exchange of performance of the moment is absolutely between you and the performer. In, in one sense, in one sense, Frank and I and Bob and all the rest, we take the step back. Yeah, no. We're not out there. You're out there. It's great. <laughs> I tell you, when the director disappears, you know, when you can get on with it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, mayhem rules. Yeah. Well, that was another thing that, that Brooke always said. Uh, I spent some time with him in the 70s after he moved to Paris. and He was with the international company in Paris. And he said, it's not a matter, you know, we're talking about rehearsal. He says, it's not a matter of telling actors what to do. It's more a matter of telling them what not to do. It's actually discovering, you know, the ways that the play doesn't work, that the performance doesn't work, and then opening up the ways in which it does work, which the energy flows in. Uh, and, uh, and, and I thought that was, a, you know, kind of interesting thing, that a lot of, a lot of rehearsal is about going down blind alleys and cool stacks and then discovering they are cool stacks and that the energy doesn't go that way, it won't grow that way. That's a dead end, get out of this, get out. And then you discover a way through, you discover a line or a moment or a thing, and the energy starts flowing again. And then you find that energy is going and you try and follow it. And it may, may go on for a few days and then suddenly you come up against another block. And you've got to find another way around. It, it, there's a sort of via negativa going around in rehearsal as well as the sort of thing of, you know, uh, this is the way to do it. In fact, you never end up saying that. It's always about, um, no. This seems to be a direction we need to go in. This actually seems not helpful. We maybe shouldn't go here. Let's let's go somewhere else. I suppose the director is the sort of first audience in Absolutely. A way, Absolutely. to the play. Yeah. And because yeah, because I have to tell you about the audiences. The audiences teach you a huge yeah. amount once you get, get get into performance. You learn a lot. You don't pander to them because you know if you get a laugh. That's fine, but you must never search for the laugh. You mustn't demand the laugh of an audience. But an audience, the energy of an audience, is the final uh, piece in the jigsaw. There's the playwright, the designer, the director, the actors. And then the final piece of the jigsaw is you, is the audience. And that energy is what creates the night, you know, the event, the experience, whatever it is. And, uh, and you can talk, it's, it's palpable. Uh, when you walk out on stage, you won't believe this, but it's true. Within five minutes, you can tell exactly the nature of the audience. Now, that's a mystery to me. I don't understand it, but I know it's true that within minutes of walking on the stage and uttering your first lines, you know the quality of the audience you've got, that they're going to be supportive, that they're going to be responsive, that they're going to be catatonic, that they're going to be, uh, um, uh, uh, what's the word, combative, um, whatever. You can, t you, you can tell within minutes. Um, but it is a huge part of the experience, is what the audience teaches you. And that must be true of a director as well. I mean, you, yeah. in preview, because we used to have previews. Oh, they're wonderful. Um, but we now have a period where the play is performed, if you're lucky, maybe as many as seven or eight times before you have you know, the, the uh, barbarians in, I mean the critics, you know, the ones who do the hatchet jobs. Um, but before you have them in, you have, 
eight or so performances. And it's during that time that That's you as a director, we as actors, learn uh, an immense amount. And that's when we do really, really hard work. And it's not the sort of forensic examination that we were talking about earlier. It's about an understanding of what is working. Yeah. Of, of what, and and, and it's also from a director's point of view, it's, it's a kind of calibration of the whole production. Because at that stage, you, you know, you are actually, you have this overall responsibility for you know, design, lighting, sound, uh, music, performances, Everything and you are. I mean, the preview period is one of the greatest inventions ever because you are actually fine tuning the whole production. So you're working constantly through it, both with the actors, of course, but as as Sinead said, I mean, the feedback is there, the actors are are away, you know, and and you can discuss the quality of the feedback, the moments, you can again fine tune scenes. A little bit of staging, which is maybe just not right, and the timing of this line, the timing of that line. Uh, so they're great, but I think th- th- that's a really good point, and it's one I, I find I, I make all the time uh, in my work here. I, I do some mentoring on the, the MA um, directing, the theatre directing course here, and I find that I f- tell the students more and more, you, know, you are the first audience, that that is. The, the, the first responsibility of the director is as the first, the first audience. Uh, and that feedback to the actors, to the playwright, uh, is, is absolutely critical. Um, you know, you are the first audience. Mm. And then you are there at the end of the process bringing, bringing the whole thing together. Uh, and, and that's where you really earn your, earn your keep, actually, as, as a director. Because uh, logistically, it, it's a nightmare. But, but, you know, that's where your choice of creative team, your production team, your casting, everything comes together, you know, at that moment. Uh, and you can actually do a hell of a lot of damage by giving the wrong note at the wrong time. Or by panicking. Uh, Patrick, you would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> never. I have loads of questions to ask you, but I 